I'm going to basically uh, divide my presentation into um, two parts. And for the first part, I just want to do a bit of um, background on the flood risk, uh, flood risks in Hammersmith and Fulham, and then talk a bit about the uh, Lead Local Flood Authority approach on the requirements that we put out there for getting suds into major schemes. And uh, part two is then to look at our case study uh, this afternoon, which is the Landmark House uh, development. So just to look at uh, some of the flood risks that we have in Hammersmith and Fulham, obviously we, we're right by the river, so we, we are in uh, uh, flood zones two and three, actually about 60% of the, of the borough is in flood zones two and three. We do have a, a river, uh, river wall defences, obviously there's the Thames barrier, so we are well protected. Um, the, uh, the map on the right though does show if there was a, a breach or overtopping of the defences then um, there would be some quite significant areas of flooding if that did ever happen. Uh, one of the good things about having most of your borough covered by flood risk uh, from the Thames and being in flood zones 2 and 3, it does mean that, that uh, you get a lot of flood risk assessments coming in and that is an opportunity to raise surface water flood risk as well because we have problems with that as well as you'll uh, see in a minute. Um, groundwater though, that's also a risk. Uh, we have a lot of basement uh, development, so uh, groundwater needs to be assessed uh, for those. Um, sewer flooding is also a problem. Um, these are the, the number of uh, uh, incidents. This is uh, Thames Water data. Um, we're actually updating at the moment, so we've probably got over 2,000 um, of these incidents now. And again, it's across the whole borough really, although most of the problem is in the south of the borough, but it is pretty much a borough-wide problem. Um, this is emphasised by, the, again, Thames Water and their uh, sewer capacity study that they carried out. Uh, Hammersmith and Fulham is on this side. So we're completely red. So red means that um, for this storm event, which I think is a one in two year storm event, the whole of the uh, sewer system in Hammersmith and Fulham is basically at capacity or it's over capacity. Um, that's for 2050, but actually I think if you looked at the 2020 uh, output from the Thames Water model, it's very similar. So we have some extreme problems in terms of sewer capacity. And then onto the surface water, um, might be a little bit difficult to see. The map on the left is an output from our surface water management plan. It's the one in a hundred year storm event with climate change factored in. All of the blue areas, which hopefully you can, you can see, um, indicate where there will be surface water flooding, uh, ponding of water. Um, and again, it's uh, a borough wide problem. There's not just one particular part of the borough where we have issues. It's pretty much from north to south. Um, and that's backed up by the, the map on the right. The, the green dots are showing flood incidents as reported, which I think is, uh, we've probably got, again, this is some of the council data. I think we have over a thousand uh, reports of, of surface water or f uh, flooding. And again, you can see the green dots show where we've had reports of flooding and it's, it's very much spread um, around the whole borough. Uh, a bit of information on the work that we do on, on, on flood risk. I was looking at uh, how many flood risk assessments we've looked at over the last three months. And uh, so I've got the figures up there. It sort of ranges from around 100 to 150 over the last three months, so for each month. That's fairly, fairly typical in terms of flood risk assessments. So this is flood risk assessments coming in with any sort of application. Minor applications will form most of these. Um, Looking at what, I, what we've done so far in 2017, so we've just done um, just under 1,200 consultations in terms of flood risk assessments and comments on those uh, this year so far. Last year we, we did almost 1,500 uh, applications in terms of flood risk. And then in looking at the major applications, which is where the Lead Local Flood Authority uh, responsibilities kick in, we've looked at 15 in the last three months. And last year it was, we did 79, so it's um, again you know, this is, we've got quite a lot of um, work that has to be done on uh, on the major schemes. A lot of those are pre-apps, which is uh, is a good sign if uh, if people take notice of what we say in the pre-app. Uh, just to explain what how what um, uh, how our sort of local lead local flood authority is, is what it consists of. It consists of myself, and I'm based in planning. And I'm from a sort of environmental policy uh, background, and uh, the other person that forms the uh, the LLFA 
is the flood risk manager who is based in highways. Um, that used to be George Warren, who I'm pleased to say is uh, here today, although uh, he did leave us for the GLA, so I'm not, <laughs> not so pleased about that. But we've also got George's replacement in the audience as well, so we're, we're very happy that uh, we've got a replacement coming next month to, to help us out. Um, the way we set things up is that we, we basically have uh, a weekly meeting that we attend. We uh, will look through applications, the major applications, so that uh, we've got an idea of um, what the proposals are, whether or not we're happy. Um, so we, we discuss them and agree what sort of comments uh, we're going to make. We'll get three weeks sort of turnaround period um, to make our comments and feed those back to the case officer. Most of the time uh, we can meet that deadline, although not, not always. Um, Final bullet point in terms of this, our most frequent response is uh, to actually raise an objection um, and uh, to say that we need further information and we provide a detailed uh, response in terms of saying why we don't, uh, if, if it is a, a, a certain strategy that, that we don't like, why we don't like it and um, what sort of information we need. We don't set out to object all the time to such strategies, it's just that we find that they don't, they don't, the, the strategies that we look at very rarely actually meet the objectives or meet the policies. So we, we, we're sort of left with no, no other choice really but, but to raise an objection. Um, now in terms of the local planning policy that we are implementing at the moment, our, our current policy is a policy that pretty much mirrors the London plan policy. We do have a new local plan policy that is, uh, has been under development for several years and is due to be adopted in January next year. And I'll put a bit of wording on there. It does try and focus more on uh, achieving greenfield runoff rates now and maximising attenuation. It also is um, going to stress more on the above ground use of suds. So, so this is about uh, managing flood risk, but actually it's about other things as well. I think previously we've we've focused a lot on the flood risk aspect, but there are other you know, there are multiple benefits of suds. But there, there are only going to be multiple benefits if you're doing above ground suds. So that's something that we're hoping to stress more in the planning guidance that we're we're currently developing. A bit of an interlude from all my my text and bullet points. These are the sort of photos, these are all photos of schemes that have been implemented in Hammersmith and Fulham, uh, not by developers I should say, but most, most I think all of these are actually um, from council led schemes. So these are really examples of the types of above ground measures that we want to see where they are feasible. Uh, these are all from the last two or three years where we've put in uh, permeable paving, rain gardens, uh, we've got uh, green roofs, swales, uh, disconnected downpipes, uh, bioretention basin there, and sort of raised planters. So these are all of the above ground suds that we want to see really if, if they can be implemented. Now I said that we, we object pretty much to every, well, probably around 90% or more sub strategies that we see with major applications. So I thought it'd be useful just to go through some of the reasons as to, to why we raise objections. Um, I've put this in quotes, but it's not really a direct quote, but it's, it's something that we get told occasionally that, um, well, my site is 100% impermeable, so what's, what, I'm not going to increase runoff, so why do I need to, to do such? Well, you need to do such because that's what the policy says you need to do. So the fact that you're 100% impermeable doesn't really come into it, I'm afraid. Um, so you can't really stick to that as a, as a reason to not do suds. Um, very often we don't see, obviously we're a London borough, so one of our key, our key parts of our development plan is the London plan. The London plan has a drainage hierarchy. That's the drainage hierarchy that we want to see followed. Uh, for the sub strategies. I know there are other drainage hierarchies out there, building regulations and other guidance and so on, but London Plan is the one that we follow, so that's the one we want you to uh, quote if you're, if you're designing suds. Rainwater harvesting not considered, this is top of the hierarchy in the London Plan, so it has to be considered so far as we're concerned because it's, it's the top priority, so it must be assessed. 
we would accept that it's not necessarily going to be feasible on every site, but we did find that once we started to stress this to developers that we did start to see rainwater harvesting being integrated, so you know, that approach has worked for us. Too much emphasis on storage tanks, and um, again, if your sort of strategy is uh, all focused on draining the water into a storage tank underground for slow release into the sewer, that is not going to comply with the SUDS policy or the SUDS hierarchy, um, the drainage hierarchy from our point of view. You've got to assess all of the other measures and, and if you don't, again, we will object. Um, I recently saw a, it was a flood risk assessment, about 100 pages. Um, there's about a page on SUDS and at the bottom, the bottom of that page it said that without discussing any other types of potential measures, that the approach for SUDS was to put all of the surface water into a tank for release into the sewer. We're not going to accept that as, a, as an approach. Infiltration. We want to try and promote infiltration where possible. It's not necessarily going to be uh, feasible everywhere in the borough, we accept that, but we want it to be uh, looked at. We have seen it used on some sites. Um, what we don't like is the use of the building regulations five metre rule about trying to keep uh, five metres between buildings and soakaways being used to try and say that therefore no infiltration is possible at all. It's sort of a, a, a misuse really of, of, uh, of the regulations. So we're not happy if we see that in any sort of strategy. Attenuation levels too low, 50%, I said is not a design target, the 50% is a, a sort of backstop, really, that um, comes from London Plan guidance. The policy actually requires you to be maximising attenuation if you're designing a sub scheme for a major, major site. Um, setting out to meet 50% when actually it's possible to do more than that, again, is likely to attract our attention and we're likely to object and push for more. Uh, similarly, the greenfield runoff rates and achieving those, um, very often we get higher, higher than greenfield runoff rates being proposed. And also we have an issue with um, the five litres per second uh, rule, if it is a rule. Uh, we, we consider that for our own schemes, we've actually gone uh, well below five litres per second for the final discharges. So therefore that's something that we expect to see on other people's uh, schemes. We don't want to see an assessment that tells us what the greenfield runoff rate is, but then jacks it back up to five litres per second because that's that's the minimum according to environment agency study or not, be, not you know uh, preventing blockages and that kind of thing. We've we've done it, and we, so we expect others to do it. And again, once once we've we've taken that position, we do see that we can get um, proposals coming through with lower than five litres per second as a runoff. Um, benefits as above ground suds not considered. I did mention obviously suds, I think, and again, we were probably guilty in, when we first started to press for suds in schemes. We were very focused on flood risk being the key reason for why we wanted suds to be implemented. And in the early days, that probably did lead to a lot of proposals which were tanks underground with controlled discharge into the sewer. That will deal with. Uh, the flood risk issue, but it is not providing any other benefit at all. And we have lots of policies that, that also require water quality benefits, uh, water efficiency benefits, biodiversity benefits um, to be pro uh, provided by development, and their SUD scheme is one way of doing that. Last bullet point on this slide, I think. Uh, oh no, it might not be actually. Um, designing, so just, just to say, designing for the one in a hundred year storm. Obviously, that is there as the uh, sort of extreme storm event that um, SUDS proposals should be able to cope with, but there are many other storm events that are going to happen much more frequently than that, that the SUDS scheme also needs to be dealing with. Um, so don't get too focused on one in a hundred year storm. On to some positive advice on how to get SUDS strategies approved. Um, I mentioned that a lot of the applications that we look at our pre apps and so we certainly um, recommend that major developments come through the pre app service so that we can give advice and um, 
point people in the right direction in terms of uh, what our policy requires, what sort of things we expect to see in strategies. Um, so obviously this is uh, a key aspect that we want to see the London Plan drainage hierarchy followed. We want above ground suds to be maximised. We want rainwater harvesting to be considered and infiltration to be put in where that's possible. Um, we do accept that it may be necessary for underground tanks to be part of that sort of strategy, but the idea is to try and minimise the amount of water that's going into the tanks. Also, minimise final discharge to the greenfield rates. As I said, we've done that on our sites, so we expect it um, on other sites. Maximise attenuation, so as I said, don't go for the 50% minimum. We know you can do more, um, so you've got to try and show that you've you've actually maximised attenuation, so you could get to above 90% attenuation. If you can do that, then 50% isn't, isn't going to work for us. And we also need maintenance information. We need to know what the maintenance uh, arrangements are going to be for all of the SUDS measures that are going on site. And we want to see some plans about where all the SUDS measures are, are going to go. Um, so ideally, what we want is as much detail up front with the application and then what we'd like to do is to then condition the implementation of a scheme um, that has been proposed um, or as far as or get as far as possible as we can on that so what we want uh, sort of applicants and the consultants to do is to, to look at our policies and guidance and then show how their scheme is complying um, with our requirements and if necessary, then you know, talk to us about you know, what her preferences are or if there's any difficulties on the side, how that can be overcome. So that's the end of my sort of part one presentation. So looking at um, what the issues are for Hammersmith and Fulham in terms of our flood risk, looking at how uh, flood risk is being, um, uh, such rather is being dealt with in the, in the planning system and uh, how we try and get sort of implemented as much as possible in the major schemes and sort of the key requirements that we, we have in terms of maximising attenuation, minimising the final discharging and using above ground measures so that you get all of the benefits. So on to um, part two. So I'm going to look at the uh, Landmark House application. So this is what is on site at the minute. Um, it's a sort of 1970s built office block. Um, there's not much um, use actually happening on the site. I don't think there's quite a lot of uh, sort of vacant floor space. It's generally not considered to be sort of fit for purpose anymore. Um, it's in Hammersmith Town Centre where there are, there are a lot of new office blocks. So it's it's sort of trying to compete with those and it and it and it can't. So that's why it's sort of come up for uh, redevelopment. So the whole thing's going to be demolished and um, uh, sort of slightly different uh, configuration of building is going to be built. So it's going to be office, hotel, cultural space there as well, some retail, a bit of public realm uh, on uh, the ground floor. Currently it's all car park, I think. Uh, there is a basement across uh, the whole site. So that's what it's going to look like um, at the end of the process. I think you've got some maybe some nicer images to come in the next presentation. So in terms of how this site processed, uh, progressed through LLFA process, we, don't, uh, we didn't get a, a sort of a formal pre-app uh, process. Uh, we didn't really get it going for, for this one, but we did have sort of brief discussions um, with, the, with the consultant on the flood risk and um, sort of requirements. Um, and then when the, uh, the full application came in, uh, it was one of those where the flood risk assessment was done by one consultant, Bureau of Hapold, and the sub-strategy was done by Rumble, who, who were going to talk about the scheme after me. So it came in sort of, uh, it was at the beginning of this, uh, this year in January, and then we started to have a look at it around sort of February and, and March time. So given what I was talking about earlier, you won't be surprised to hear that we objected to the sort of strategy that came in. Um, and some of these are going to look quite familiar. So there was no, we, it wasn't really clear where the drainage hierarchy was being followed or not. The 50% the target had um, sort of been used to uh, design two, 
the um, in terms of the surge. So there was a 50% improvement, but we felt we could get we should be able to get more on the site. Uh, the greenfield rate hadn't been achieved, and it was too reliant on underground tanks. There was some alternative measures that had been mentioned in terms of landscaping and gardens, but there wasn't really any detail on that aspect. And it was those sort of aspects that really we wanted to see more information on. And also we noted that Thames Water raised concerns, um, so they would, will frequently uh, flag up problems for new development in Hammersmith and Fulham because of the lack of sewer capacity. So you know, that also puts uh, the pressure back on in terms of trying to do more with the with the certain proposals. So it was missing the target <laughs> from uh, from our from our perspective. Um, so we gave our comments back to the case officer, and then then those comments go passed back to the uh, the developer and uh, consultants. We started up um, email discussions on how um, the strategy uh, needed to be uh, revised, and then we did hold a meeting uh, so that we could discuss and go through. So Ramble sort of came up with. Um, uh, revisions to the strategy and came in and uh, put those in front of us and we, we discussed the amendments and we uh, agreed that the amendment sounds like that it was the, the way to go. So what had been improved, so the, the final discharge rate had come down to 2.4 litres per second so that was uh, quite a big improvement. There was a large increase in terms of the amount of attenuation achieved so I think we've ended up with over 90% compared to what's currently happening on site. Rainwater harvesting had made it into uh, the strategy. Green roofs were there, uh, some rain gardens, permeable paving, and there's still an attenuation tank, but the, uh, the volume of the tank had come down as a result of including the sort of preferred uh, measures. So in terms of Next steps, we've, we accepted that revised SUD strategy and removed our objection to, to the application. And the application has been through our planning committee in July, so it's recommended for approval and uh, it did get approved. Um, not all recommendations for approval get approved. One last night went through for approval and got refused. Um, so it's got some SUD conditions on there. So we still want to see um, a revised sort of strategy prior to commencement to confirm the inclusion of the measures that have been highlighted, just so we get more, more detail on, um, on what's going to be included. So for my summary of what, uh, what I've presented there, we've, we've looked at um, Landmark House in terms of it's a good opportunity for subs to be included into a major scheme. The original strategy was objected to by the, the lead local flood authority and revisions were required before we would remove that objection and then we started to work um, together with Ramble in terms of uh, revising the, the strategy and increasing the inclusion of the priority subs measures which was done to our satisfaction and the objection was removed and the application has been approved. Thank you. A quick question. You, you kind of inferred that you get consulted on major apps. Obviously, you're trying to progress towards you can either approve an application or condition it. I want to go next state and look at discharge of conditions. Do you get consulted on those? Uh, yes, yes, we do. Okay, secondary question then. How often do you have to object to discharge of conditions because the system as designed at planning application stage is very different to the system being proposed for construction? Uh, yes, it does happen. I mean, we, it's by no means do we um, see perfect applications to discharge conditions. So it's only, yes, you're right, it's only part of the story to sort of get through the application because then you've got the conditions and so we have had applications where we have, we've had probably two or three iterations of um, more, you know, details to, to get to the point where we're happy 
Uh, and it, it, it does happen that um, an application gets approved with a strategy written by one consultant. They're then taken off the job and another consultant comes in and then they start to almost go try and go back to square one. And we have to go back to square one and say, well, hold on. Um, we, uh, we've got the FRA, we've got the third strategy. This is what you're supposed to be doing. You can't go back and start rewriting it now. So you do have to keep an eye on on what's happening with uh, discharging conditions, definitely. I just wanted to ask, 90%, you were talking about the attenuation there, how that was achieved? Was it sort of...? Well, it's a, it's a combination of all the measures that, um, that I, was, I was listing. So it's, um, some of it is from above ground, um, above ground uh, proposals and such measures. Uh, there is a still there is still an attenuation tank as part of the um, the actual SUDS strategy, but so some of it will be will, will be coming from an attenuation it, tank. But there are others. is Catherine presenting on that revised strategy? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll take one, I'll take one more before we move on to Catherine. Uh, it's just a quick one on the five litres a second and that that query. Obviously, I understand where you're coming from that you can reduce it beyond that level and it's completely laudable, completely I'd agree why, why you're doing it. From a consultant's perspective, we have the general advice from the EA that's five litres a second. I've spoken to a lot of the flow control device manufacturers, they go lower than that but they have no long term testing and maintenance and blockage systems. You've done it yourselves but that's at your own liability as a consultant. It will be on our liability if that then blocked. So, how have you had reaction from consultants about going beyond that figure? Um, well, we're getting agreement. Um, the, the landmark house scheme—they've they've proposed to go below five um, over time because we we've, we've been stressing that it is possible to go below five liters per second. I think we're starting to see acceptance from consultants who are, who are putting together sort of strategies that, that that is it's acceptable to do that i think generally the feeling is that that ea guidance is out of date and there will be some more guidance coming through quite soon which actually shows that there isn't a need to limit the final discharge to five liters per second so we're, we're in a bit of an area at the moment where that might be the existing guidance but I think people know that actually that, that limitation um, is not really relevant at this stage. So if we see, if we see discharges being proposed for five litres per second as the limit, then we will certainly push against that. Do you know where that new guidance is coming from, quickly? Um, I know Thames Water are hoping to do some guidance on it, because obviously it's a, relevant, uh, it's a relevant issue for them. So hopefully they will, they will do something on that.